The Peter Schiff Show. It was a relatively quiet week this week. Uh, not a lot of market-driven data. Next week, things might pick up a bit. We'll get the final week of the second quarter. So I have a feeling there may be a little bit more action as maybe some of the portfolio managers look to uh, window dress a bit or get their portfolios looking better for the end of the second quarter. The dollar finished the week on a down note, although it was relatively flat on the week. It was down today. The opposite for gold, up about six and a half bucks. It was also flat on the week, but had a good day. You know, the gold stocks were not flat. I think the gold stocks were probably, as a group, the best performing sector uh, in the market. And I've been talking on this podcast that I have been noticing that these stocks have been trading better. Uh, you know, they had been weaker. They uh, precipitated the uh, correction in the price of gold. Uh, then gold bottomed out when the gold stocks showed some relative strength. And that has been continuing. And I think this was a pretty good week. Technically, we're very close to maybe getting above some key resistance here on these stocks. And so we'll see what kind of bid they can pick up next week uh, when, again, we're wrapping up the second quarter. I think the significant thing, though, for the dollar and gold is that the dollar is in the process of putting in a very significant top. And the flip side of that is that gold is in the process of putting in a significant bottom. And I think the catalyst for breakdowns in the dollar and breakouts in gold is going to be some realization, some capitulation on the part of the markets, the Fed, to square perception with reality. Because, you know, the economic surprise index is at the lowest it's been since 2011. People have been looking forward to good news, and they've been disappointed constantly with the failure of that good news to materialize. You know, the last time uh, the economy was this surprisingly weak, that was in 2011. The Fed launched Operation Twist. The following year, they followed up with QE3. So the Fed was very worried back then. They were doing everything they could to artificially stimulate the economy. Now you have a similar situation today with the economic news being a lot worse than the Fed and everybody else thinks, yet instead of looking to stimulate the economy, they want to sedate it. They want to raise interest rates. They want to do quantitative tightening. And again, too, if you look at the GDP numbers uh, from Q1, you look at now the lowered estimates for Q2, you look at the final quarter of last year, the economy is very weak. The economy is much weaker today than it was at many points during the Obama administration when the Fed was adding stimulus because it was so concerned that the economy wasn't strong enough, yet now it's weaker than it was then, yet the Federal Reserve is uh, raising interest rates and threatening QE2. You know, Donald Trump, since he's been elected, the Fed has raised interest rates three times. Uh, and you know, prior to Trump's election, the Fed raised interest rates only once during the entire two terms of the Obama presidency. So something has got to give here. The Fed cannot continue uh, to act as if it's going to continue to tighten monetary policy while ignoring the deteriorating outlook for the economy as measured by their own data that they claim to be dependent on. But, you know, I don't want to spend this podcast talking about uh, the markets. You know, I was talking to my son Spencer, my older son, who's going to be 15 uh, in in August. And, you know, he used to listen to my podcast a lot and he hasn't been listening too much recently. And I asked him why. And he said, well, you know, Dad, you're, you're talking too much about the markets. And, you know, I'm more interested in the economic stuff or the political stuff. And, you know, of course, sometimes when I talk about politics and economics, I get complaints. Hey, Peter, stay off of the politics. You know, we want to hear what you have to say about economics. But I like to keep a mixture I like to, you know, appease the entire audience. So, Spencer, this podcast, the rest of this podcast anyway, is for you. And, of course, you know, if you if you want more of these type of podcasts or you like them, I think this is a good way to introduce me uh, to other people. You know, I mentioned on a previous podcast that I saw my YouTube subscribers were actually going down. So that stopped. I'm now I'm adding subscribers now to the YouTube channel. I'm not really sure on the podcast. But I still believe I should have a lot more people listening than there are. So 
help me out, you know, share this, um, these podcasts, these YouTube videos with your friends uh, on social media. Help me really, uh, you know, increase the audience because I think I have a lot to say and I'd like to have a bigger soapbox uh, with which to say it from. So, you know, you can take it, use these. These are the type of podcasts. If I talk economics and politics, they're more interesting to a lot of people than just wondering what, you know, what's going on in the market. Now, the big political news of the day was the Republicans in the Senate finally unveiling their version of Obamacare repeal and replace. And it's very heavy on the replace, but there really isn't any repeal. I mean, they're replacing it with something that's almost as bad. In fact, it may even be worse. I mean, it is possible that the Senate version of Obamacare is actually worse than the one that we have now. But regardless, even if it's not as bad, we still shouldn't enact it. I mean, we still have to let this ship sink while it's called the SS Obamacare. We don't want it to sink when it has some kind of Republican brand on it, because then guess who gets to blame or guess what gets to blame? But, you know, the House already passed their version. And I already did a criticism of the House's version. The Senate version is even worse, if you can believe it. Now, the big problem here, the Senate version takes away all of the penalties for not buying insurance, right? At least the House version, they tried to create some type of penalty for people that don't buy insurance, right? But I argue that it was a ridiculous penalty. It was really too low to be effective, and so it wasn't going to work. But the Senate doesn't even you know, have a pretense of a penalty, now, a lot of people would say, well, Peter, isn't that a good thing? I mean, don't you agree that, you know, the government shouldn't be forcing people to buy insurance and taxing people who don't do it? Yes, I agree. As long as we have a free market in insurance, as long as you don't simultaneously tell the insurance companies that they have to cover people with pre-existing conditions and they have to charge the sick people the exact same price that they charge healthy people who have the same age and, you know, everything else the same, once you do that, once you ban insurance companies from discriminating based on pre-existing conditions, then you better have a meaningful and viable punishment to make sure that all the healthy people buy insurance. Because the free market solution to making healthy people buy insurance is that if they wait until they're sick, they can't get it. So the free market has a way of forcing healthy people to buy insurance. The government gives them a reason and a means not to do it. Because if the government says, hey, just wait till you get sick, well, then no one's going to buy it when they're healthy because why waste money? So the Senate bill takes away all the punishment, but the insurance companies have to give you coverage no matter what. Under all circumstances, there's no way around it. So basically what the Senate bill does is it turns insurance companies into uh, medical bill payers, right? They're not really selling insurance. They're just there to pay your medical bills. And that is not a money-making uh, business. There's no profit in just paying somebody's medical bills, especially if the premiums you're charging them are less than the medical bills they're asking you to pay. So the only way that insurance companies can survive if the Senate bill was actually enacted, is with massive government subsidies. And when I say government, I mean taxpayer. And that is actually in the Senate bill. The Senate is supposed to subsidize insurance companies to cover their losses. Now, of course, the losses are going to be much bigger than the politicians uh, assume because they don't understand the moral hazard of what they're doing. And so the amount of money that is going to be required to be spent is going to be enormous. So we're going to have to spend more money subsidizing the insurance companies because they're underpricing insurance than if we simply paid the higher premiums if they are allowed to more accurately price their insurance. So this is a disaster. It will eventually lead to a complete collapse of the insurance industry and single-payer socialized medicine. And if the Republicans in the Senate, if they really want socialized medicine, just come out and say it. I mean, just don't try to get there in this roundabout way. If you don't believe in the free market, you don't believe in capitalism, if you believe in government, just come out and say it. 
And if we, if you believe in socialized medicine, why stop there? How about socialized food, socialized clothing, socialized housing, socialize everything. If the government could deliver health care cheaper and better than the free market, then, well, then it could deliver everything cheaper and better than the free market, right? Because health care is just a good. I don't care how they want to spin it. It's a good. And, and, and if you think the government is more efficient, can be, can be more economical than the free market, then that's what you believe, right? Of course, this is all a bunch of nonsense. And maybe a lot of Republicans don't believe that, but they're afraid to say it. They're afraid to stand up for principle because they want to get elected. And they know that the voters don't understand that capitalism works. They just want something for nothing and they want to get elected. So they're going to provide it for them. I mean, think about it. What is insurance? And I, I've talked about this before, but I really want to hammer this point, right? Insurance is something that you buy that you probably will not need, right? That's why you buy it. In fact, usually when you're buying insurance, you hope you never need it, right? Think about automobile insurance, right? We buy automobile insurance. Do we want to use our insurance? No, because that means we got into an accident. Something bad happened, right? Insurance is there to offset a bad thing that happens, right? So something bad happens, you lose money, and so you have insurance to make up for what you lost. But of course, you'd rather not lose anything, right? So you don't want your insurance. So then why do you buy it? Just in case, right? You buy it just in case. Now, when it comes to automobile insurance, right? How often do you use your automobile insurance? Rarely. I mean, but you do use it because statistically, if you're on the road a lot, over the course of time, you're going to have a couple of accidents in your life. Maybe they're not severe, fender bender, something is going to happen and you're going to need your insurance, right? But maybe once every five years, once every 10 years. I mean, not that often, right? And of course, when you need it, all right, you know, so it's something that's expensive and you, you, you put in a claim. But actually in auto insurance, for most people, they still end up paying more for the insurance than they collect over the years, right? Because all the years you don't have accidents, you're paying for policy that you don't need. But it's for a lot of people buy it because they don't really have the resources, right? If somebody totals their car, they just don't have the money to replace it. So they have to buy the insurance. Otherwise, they're out of luck. Now, of course, if they borrowed money to buy their car, right, the bank is going to require you to have insurance because, you know, if the car breaks, that's the collateral for their loan. But you don't use it a lot. Now, what about fire insurance? See, fire insurance, most people never use that, right? You can have a fire insurance policy, and chances are you're going to pay that premium your entire life, and you're never going to use it. And you're happy about it. Who wants their house to burn down? Nobody. I mean, unless you're an arsonist, right? You're doing it on purpose, which is a crime. The average person does not want their house to burn down. But they buy insurance, right? Why? Because if it does burn down, they need the money. Because if your house burns down, most people can't you know, rebuild it on their own. And of course, if you have a mortgage, the bank is going to say, hey, you got to have insurance. You got to have fire insurance on, on that house. So you buy it and you hope and you probably never use it. Now, once in a while, somebody gets unlucky and their house burns down. Why does the insurance company have the money to rebuild it? Because they collected all these premiums from all these people whose houses didn't burn down. Now they have the money to pay the premiums for people whose house did burn down. What if the government came in and said, oh, this is terrible. You know, we don't like these insurance companies. You know, this poor guy, his house burned down and he didn't have any insurance. And, you know, he tried to buy a policy and nobody would sell it to him. This is terrible. He's homeless. We need to stop these fire insurance companies from discriminating against people who have pre-existing conditions, right? Let's make fire insurance companies sell fire insurance to people even after their house burns down for the same price as the people who buy it when their houses are not on fire, right? Well, what would that do to fire insurance? It would destroy the whole industry. There would no longer be any fire insurance because if you could wait till after your house burns down to buy the policy, nobody would buy it before it burns down because you know you're probably not going to need it. But of course, under those circumstances, there won't be any fire insurance to buy because the only reason the insurance company can provide the insurance is because so many people who don't have that pre-existing condition are buying the insurance anyway because they know if they ever get it, they can't buy it, right? Think about life insurance. Who buys a life insurance policy wanting to put in a claim? Nobody, right? That's the one, that's the one insurance that you hope you definitely never need. Because 
Life insurance pays off, you got to die, right? Nobody wants to die. So why does somebody buy life insurance? Well, you buy life insurance for peace of mind because you don't want to have to worry about, hey, what happens if something happens to me? What happens to my kids? What happens to my wife? How can they pay the mortgage? How can they go to college, right? So a guy will buy insurance so that if he dies, his family has some way of making up for the financial loss because you're no longer there as the main breadwinner to provide for your family. So you want to make sure that they have this extra money. Well, how does the insurance company get the money? Where do they have the money to provide for your family? From all the people who bought policies who never died, who never put in a claim. Now, yes, everybody is going to die eventually, but the life insurance doesn't last that long. I mean, if you're, you know, you're a 20, 25 year old guy and you're buying life insurance. It doesn't matter if you die when you're 90. You don't have to have insurance for that. Your kids are, your kids have kids of their own. You only need to buy insurance, you know, for, you know, let's say, until you're 45, 50, right? Get your kids through college, get them out of that, you know. And so during those years, it's very rare. Most people don't die, uh, you know, before they're in their mid 50s. I mean, it happens once in a while, but it's very rare. That means insurance is pretty cheap, right? When you're, you know, when you're young. Now, look, what if the government said, well, you know, insurance companies can't discriminate. They, you know, they should have to sell people life insurance no matter how old they are, no matter how sick they are. Well, then there would be no life insurance either, right? So that is actually insurance. But think about health insurance. People are using their health insurance all the time. I mean, every time they go to the doctor, they're using their insurance. Every time they go to the drugstore, you go to the CVS, you buy a subscription, you whip out your insurance card and you use it. This is not insurance. This is using your insurance company to pay your medical bills. That's not right. Look, when you buy automobile insurance, right, in case you get an accident, every time you fill up your car, you don't provide the gas station with your insurance information and bill your insurance company for your gas. Right? If you if you need an oil change, it's not your insurance company that's paying for it. Or if you have to replace your tires, this is normal wear and tear. You pay for this stuff yourself. Nobody would expect their insurance company to pay for their gas. And if the insurance companies did pay for your gas, it's auto insurance would be off the charge. Nobody could afford it. Nobody would buy it. Yet everybody expects health insurance companies to pay for routine medical care that you're going to need, right? You don't provide insurance for that. There is no money in providing insurance for a known expense, right? Like, like you know, childbirth. People, women who are married and trying to get pregnant can buy insurance to cover the cost of having a baby. That is ridiculous. I mean, obviously you're gonna have a baby and it's gonna cost money. Your insurance company shouldn't be the one that's paying for it. And you know, back when I was a kid, when I was born, it, nobody had insurance for childbirth. And it, you know, people had a lot more kids. In the 1950s, you know, people had four, five, six kids. They didn't need insurance for any of it. You know, when my mom, when I was born, I think she stayed in the hospital for two weeks and she didn't have a C-section. She had a regular birth. Today, you have a regular birth. You're almost out the next day. It's like fast food deliveries. And it costs a fortune. Why was childbirth so inexpensive back in the 50s? And why is it so expensive now? And don't say technology, because technology should make it cheaper. Now that we have better equipment for monitoring women while they're pregnant, for looking at the baby, for seeing if anything's going wrong, we have all this new medical technology that should be reducing the cost of childbirth. It should be cheaper today to have a child than it was in the 50s and the 1960s. The only reason it's not is because of government, because of the massive government subsidies that are involved in, in health care. I mean, it's the same way with education. Why is a college degree so much more expensive now than it was in the 50s, despite all this technology that should be bringing down the costs? After all, Televisions are a lot cheaper than they were in the 1950s. Computers are a lot cheaper. Telephones are a lot cheaper. All kinds of stuff that the free market provides are cheaper today than they were in the 50s and way more complicated. You know, the government always likes to say, well, you know, health care is different or education is different. No, it's not. It's the same. What's different is that's where the government is involved. And in technology is where the government is not involved. So where you have the free market, it works. In fact, even in healthcare, where the government is not involved, where the insurance company is not involved, it works. Look at eye LASIK surgery, right? Eye LASIK surgery, 
I think the price of that has come down about 75% over the last 20 years. 75% down. You know, the lasers are more sophisticated, they're better, but the price is going down. Why? Well, because insurance doesn't cover it. So it's a free market, right? When someone decides they don't want to wear glasses anymore and they want to have eye LASIK surgery, what do they do? They call up four or five doctors and they say, hey, I want to have LASIK. What do you charge? They look on the internet, they shop around. The doctors know that people are shopping around, so they try to economize, they try to be as efficient as possible, and it works. None of these market-based efficiencies are working when it comes to healthcare, right? Because none of it is insurance. It's all prepaid medical wrapped up as insurance. And of course, because the government is driving up the price of health care so much, more and more people can't afford it. That's why they want it for free. See, that's really what the politicians are selling. And that's why they can't repeal Obamacare, because people don't want uh, insurance. They want somebody else to pay their medical bills. You know, the same thing is going to happen eventually with education, right? Government makes college so expensive, but everybody thinks they have to go. But now that it's so expensive, the next thing you know, the government's going to have to provide it for free. Everybody gets free education because nobody could afford to go. But it's only because of the government that the price is so high. The same thing has happened with health insurance. People should be buying insurance just for a catastrophic event, right? Let's say you're in your 20s or your 30s. The odds that you actually need health insurance are very slim, right? I mean, how many 20 or 30 year olds actually have a problem? Not that many, right? I mean, you know, I mean, you're, you're, you're not going to start having medical problems in general until your 50s or 60s or even 70s, right? When you're in your 20s, 30s, and 40s, very little is going to go wrong. Now, of course, there is an exception, right? There is a slim chance that something bad can happen to you. That's perfect for insurance because when there's a slim chance that something bad can happen to you, you can buy that insurance very cheap, right? And then if enough young, healthy people want to make sure that they're covered in case a really bad thing happens and they buy that insurance, then the insurance companies collect a lot of money, right, from all these people, and now they can afford to pay off the claims to the few people the unlucky people that draw the short straw in life and, and oh, they got cancer. They got a brain tumor, right? They got hit by a bus. Something really bad happened when you're young. But if you tell these young, healthy people, hey, you don't have to buy this catastrophic insurance because if you do develop cancer, just go buy your insurance when you get it. Well, if you know you're probably not going to develop cancer, why buy the policy in the first place? If you can buy it after you get cancer, you'd be an idiot to buy it before, especially since the odds of you getting it are so slim anyway. Even if the insurance is cheap, it's money down the drain. But the problem is the insurance now is not cheap. It would be cheap if the government stayed out of it. Healthcare would be cheap, but the government doesn't stay out of it. Now, of course, as you get older, right, you're going to need more medical care, right? Things are going to start to go wrong with your body as you get older, right? This is not something that's probably not gonna happen. This is something that is going to happen, right? We all age and our bodies break down. Now you can do things, you can eat right, you can exercise, right? You can do things to slow this process down. Of course, there are some people that do things to speed it up. There are people that, you know, overeat, they smoke, they don't exercise, right? They're gonna have problems sooner rather than, than later. But how does the free market take care of this? Well, first of all, in a free market, right, if you are overweight and smoke and, you know, you're going to, you know, you're going to pay more for your insurance, right? The insurance company is going to figure this out and they're going to, they're going to price your policy higher because, you know, you're, you're not taking care of yourself. Whereas if you do take care of yourself, you'll get rewarded with, with a lower cost, right? Which is a good positive thing, the way, the way the market works. But what you're supposed to do is while you're young and healthy, and spending a little bit of money on a catastrophic policy that you're probably not going to need, but you buy it just in case, you save your money, right? That's, you know, if you don't know what savings are, that's the money you don't spend, right? It's kind of like a lot of Americans don't know what that is, but that means you earn money, but you actually don't spend it, right? You save it for the future. You save it for when you're older and you may have more medical needs, right? So by the time you're in your 60s or 70s, if you know, as you need to spend more money on health care, you'll actually have it because you saved money for 30, 40 years of your life while you were working. But of course, now with all this government, all these taxes, people are having a hard time saving. So they're looking for a freebie. 
older people who are broke and have no money want the government to provide them with their medical care. Now, they want to call it insurance. I just want to buy cheap insurance. But what they really want is government paid for health care or they want the insurance companies to pay for it. Right. They just think they're, they're entitled uh, to free health care. They're not. Now, I know people are going to think, but, you know, everybody is going to need medical care when they get older. And so what are we supposed to do? Just let these sick people die? No. A, people are going to save money when they're younger so that when they are older, they'll have the money to pay for it. Right. And again, if we had the free market in health care, like just like we have with eye LASIK surgery, the operations that a lot of older people routinely need are going to be a lot cheaper. So you won't even need to save as much money to pay for it. Then, of course, doctors will work pro bono. If they're not tied up spending all their time filling out insurance forms, dealing with malpractice, dealing with Medicare, believe me, doctors would spend time treating people who really can't afford it for, you know, for lower money or for free, and there'd be private charities. I mean, this is how it used to work before the government came in and screwed it up. Now, of course, let's say, you know, look, you live long enough, you're going to get everything, right? I mean, eventually, if you live long enough, you're getting cancer, right, at some point, right? But I mean, if you get cancer when you're 95 years old, 100 years old, does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. I mean, that, I mean that's it. I mean, are you gonna are you going to spend money to fight cancer when you're 95 or 100 years old? I mean, first of all, the treatment might kill you. So if you don't die of the cancer, you're going to die of the, the chemo or the, the, the radiation, whatever it is they do to cure the cancer. And if you don't die of cancer, you're dying of something. I mean, once you get to be that old, so, I mean, we really don't have to worry about how a 100-year-old person is going to cover the cost of cancer. I mean, they're not. I mean, that's it. You make it to 100, you, you know, you, you've already won the lottery. Yeah, there are people that make it to 105, 110. I mean, it's a very, very small percentage of the population. So some people manage to avoid these things. But look, they die as something. We're all going to die, right? Uh, but the, the time that it's important is if somebody gets cancer or a bad thing, in their 50s, 60s, 70s. Okay, that's when you still have enough of your life in front of you that it really makes sense to, to do some of the operations or do some of the things that it will extend your life for another 10 or 20 years and you'll still have productive years. But people can save for that and they can have the catastrophic type of insurance to help them out. You know, they, if they have a big deductible, it won't cost very much, right? All this would work. The market would work, but no, the market isn't being allowed to work because of politics, right? Because of the failures of democracy, because the people don't understand the free market. And even if these Republican senators understand the free market, they are afraid to stand up for it. They're afraid to actually sell a free market message to the voters because they, they're worried about having to deal with the message from the left, which is just, they're mean. Right. I mean, the, the bigger problem, too, about this um, this Republican bill is they're cut. They're getting rid of all the taxes. And now they're like, oh, this is just a tax cut for the rich. You know, it's really rich, too, to me, the way they describe this as a transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich. How is it a transfer from the poor to the rich? The poor don't have any wealth to transfer. You're talking about taxes that were imposed on the rich. And now we're cutting those taxes so the rich can keep the money that we were stealing. You're telling me that if a thief doesn't steal your money, that you're stealing from the thief because he didn't take your money? It's an Orwellian upside down world where you call redistribution when you stop taking money away from somebody. Redistribution is when you take money away from some person and give it to somebody else. So when they originally passed Obamacare and they taxed the rich to provide health care to the poor, that was redistribution. When you stop taxing the rich, you stop the redistribution. But the way the left is spinning this, this is sold as a redistribution uh, from the poor to the rich, as if the poor had anything to redistribute. But the bigger problem with the bill is it doesn't work. It accepts the notion that the government is there to provide health care, that it can do it better and cheaper than the free market. It's a total capitulation by the Republicans to Obama and Obamacare. And why? So they can put their brand on this ship so when it sinks, they get the blame? I mean, they've got to vote this thing down. I mean, there's no way they're even going to be able to, to change it. But again, the problem is democracy because the people don't know, right? They've been dumbed down. 
They've, they've lived their lives in government schools. They've been taught by socialist teachers, and they're voting by the time they're 18. you got kids that haven't even graduated high school that are already voting for these idiots. But they're, they're not that dumb that they don't know how to win an election. Right? The way you win an election is promise people something for nothing. And when you promise people something for nothing, the people who are getting something for nothing will vote for you. Right? And that's the way it is. You know, look at look look at Puerto Rico. How did Puerto Rico get into so much trouble, right? The Puerto Rican government kept borrowing money and doling it out to government workers who kept voting for their employers who were giving them raises. But you know, the funniest thing, and this shows you how we never learn, what is everybody recommending for Puerto Rico? How is Puerto Rico going to be saved? And the solution that everybody has is, oh, statehood. They need to become a state. Look, Puerto Rico, right? is a mess now, they're broke, without the income tax. Can you imagine if the Puerto Rican economy is so weak now, without having the income tax, the federal income tax, without having the Obamacare tax, can you imagine how much worse it would be if we impose those taxes? I mean, think about it. You've got these people sitting around thinking, oh, the Puerto Rican economy is in trouble. Uh, they're not growing. They have a lot of unemployment. Um, what can we do to help? Oh, I know. Let's add an income tax. Let's add the Obamacare tax. Let, let's send down the IRS. Let's, let's, it's like an invasion of IRS agents. Look, the people of Puerto Rico have enough problems with mosquitoes and Zika. The last thing they need is an infestation of IRS agents. How are you going to improve the efficiency of an economy by sending down IRS agents with a bunch of forms regulating and taxing people? Yet that is what is being proposed as a solution. Look, Puerto Rico is in trouble because they have too much government in San Juan. How is adding even more government in Washington, D.C. going to solve the problem? And of course, one of the reasons that so many people are voting for statehood is because the Puerto Rican politicians have told the Puerto Rican voters, if we can only be a state, you could get more welfare. So people are voting for statehood because they think it means more welfare. Meanwhile, the people who are actually working in Puerto Rico that aren't on welfare, they're going to be taxed. They're going to have to pay a federal income tax when they're not paying any right now. So if Puerto Rico became a state, you would have a massive incentive not to work because that you'd have the highest taxes of any state in the union because they already have a 30 percent tax in Puerto Rico income tax and 11 percent sales tax. They have a higher sales tax than any other state and they have a higher income tax than any other state. Right. I mean, the number two state would be California. But if Puerto Rico became a state, the, the tax burden in Puerto Rico would dwarf the tax burden in California. I mean, so it would be a complete collapse. Yet that is what these geniuses are recommending. Because why? Because this is how people vote. This is what they vote for. You know, I want to give you one last example of this. I was watching today on CNBC. They were talking to Crandall, who is the CEO, I think, of American Airlines. And he's on there because um, Qatar Airlines is wanting to buy a 5% stake or 10% stake in one of the domestic carriers. I forget, is it Delta, American, United? I, I don't remember. But obviously, you know, he's against it, doesn't think it's fair. But I'm listening to him on CNBC, and he starts to talk about how this is unfair that foreign governments like Qatar, they subsidize their, you know, flagship airlines, and therefore the American airlines can't compete, and this isn't fair, and we want a level playing field. And I'm thinking, oh, this is ridiculous. This is such hypocrisy. You know, there's that expression, when you live in a glass house, don't throw stones. Well, the U.S. government has tremendous protection for domestic carriers. I, I spoke about this once before on, uh, on the podcast, and I don't know what it was, maybe even a year or two ago, but I'm going to do it again because it's, it's worth mentioning, and a lot of people might not have listened to it. But if, I don't know if you know this, but the rules in America... A foreign carrier cannot pick up and drop off a passenger between two points in the United States. So what I mean is, let's say Cathay Pacific is flying from New York to Hong Kong. And let's say on the way, it stops off in Los Angeles, right? So they're allowed to sell a ticket from New York to Hong Kong. And they're allowed to sell a ticket from L.A. to Hong Kong. But they're not allowed to sell a ticket from New York to L.A., even though the flight is, land, is taking off from New York and landing in L.A., right? So there's plenty of opportunity for people to deplane 
in LA who got on the plane in New York, but that's illegal. They cannot sell that ticket. So the US government forces uh, Cafe Pacific or anyone else to fly with empty seats. Now, how do I know there's empty seats? Well, there has to be empty seats because they're stopping in LA to pick up more passengers. They wouldn't do that if the plane was full. They would just fly nonstop, right? So the reason they do stop in LA is to pick up the extra passengers. But why are we wasting all these resources? You know, first of all, all these politicians, they, they, they pretend to care about the environment. Well, if you have a jet and it's flying half full, you know, aren't you wasting energy? Isn't that bad for the environment? Why not allow that plane to operate, you know, with all the seats uh, used? The reason is protectionism. They want to protect, U.S. politicians want to protect U.S. airlines from that competition. So they make it illegal for all these foreign carriers to sell those seats. Therefore, they reduce the supply of seats. Therefore, they increase the price of the seats for the American airlines, meaning they increase the cost of traveling for Americans. Now, look, you know, this is a great route, a popular route, you know, coast to coast, people going from New York to San Francisco or Los Angeles. Imagine if you can get a ticket on Singapore Airlines or New Zealand Airline or Cafe Pacific. Hey, these are great airlines. The service is better. The seats are nicer. People would love to buy tickets on these airlines to fly domestically if the government would only let them. And, you know, if the government allowed it, it would force American carriers to up their game to compete with the foreign carriers. But it's not happening because of government. Now, you know, the argument that the airlines make and Crandall was making this argument is, oh, it saves jobs, right? Because, you know, if, if American Airlines had to compete, right, with these foreign airlines, well, we could lose jobs, right? It could cost American jobs. And maybe, yeah, maybe that's true. Maybe some people uh, that work for American Airlines would lose their jobs if they had to compete with foreigners. But that would also mean that air travel was less expensive. Well, how many jobs are being destroyed because Americans are forced to pay more for their travel. Because first of all, if these other airlines like Cafe Pacific could sell these, these seats instead of fly empty, right, obviously they could sell them for a discount. And so that would reduce the cost of traveling coast to coast. In addition, if Singapore Airlines or any of these airlines could sell these empty legs, then the entire cost of the flight could be amortized over more people because the planes would always be full which means that they could reduce the cost of international air travel. Well, what happens if you reduce the cost of air travel, more people are going to travel because it's a function of supply and demand. The cheaper it is to travel, the more people who can afford to do it. So by keeping air travel artificially expensive to protect some airline jobs, what jobs are being destroyed in the hotel industry? Because now fewer people are traveling, so fewer people need hotels. What about car rentals? If fewer people are traveling, fewer people rent cars. And of course, if you have to spend more money on an airline ticket, then you have less money to spend on something else. So now the people that work in the industries where they were selling to something else that you didn't buy, there's going to be job losses there. See, the economists would call it the seen versus the unseen. See, when a politician comes and does something, passes some law that protects airlines from competition, and save some jobs in the airline industry, all the airline workers know that their jobs were saved and they know who did it, the politician. And now the politician can be rewarded for his good work with a vote or with political contributions or with the union working on their behalf to help get out the vote, right? Because you have an immediate beneficiary. And of course, once there's a special subsidy that benefits you, then you, you need that subsidy to stay there. So now you keep bribing politicians to make sure that you keep your subsidy, right? This is what's going on. But all the people who benefit from lower air fire, just the traveling public, they're not a constituency. They don't see that they're being hurt by this rule. In fact, most of them don't even know that this rule exists, right? So there is no broad constituency, even though the, the, the larger public benefits from lower air prices it's a faction, a political faction that benefits from higher prices, but the politician doesn't care about what's good for the economy because that doesn't win him any votes. He cares what's good for a special interest group 
because he can count on votes and money from that group. You know, even with this, you know, tax reform that we're doing now. And by the way, you know, if they really wanted to kill two birds with one stone to really reform health care, not only would they repeal Obamacare, right, and they would repeal every other government law that interferes with the free market and that drives up the cost of both insurance and health care, but they would eliminate the deduction for employer provided health insurance because that is the problem. That is why so many people pay for everything with insurance because they get it from their boss. Because if they're if your boss gives you money to pay for your health care, you got to pay income taxes. But if your boss gives you health insurance instead of money, you pay no taxes on the value of that insurance. That creates this distortion to order overutilize insurance and to use insurance for something it's not meant for. So what we need to do is we need to get rid of that deduction, right? Get rid of, so if an employer pays you in insurance, it's taxed as if he had paid you in cash. And if they do that, then no one's going to take the insurance. Everybody's going to want the cash. And we need to get rid of all these deductions, all these sacred cows. We need to get rid of the mortgage deduction too. And if we get rid of all these deductions, then we can lower the income tax rate so that people don't spend more money. The government doesn't collect more. We just pay a lower rate on broader income where we don't get all these deductions, but you have a special interest group for every single deduction. You know, the best thing that you could do with the income tax is eliminate it completely, like take it to zero, right? So then the deductions are worthless anyway, right? Because once we have no income tax, then it doesn't matter, you know, how benefits are taxed, what happens to your mortgage, right? But in order to do that, we got to dramatically cut government spending. But here's something that's funny. I bet you, If they were proposing to eliminate the income tax, the housing industry would be against it because they would say, oh, my God, if we lose the income tax, we lose the mortgage deduction. Yes, of course, because you don't need the deduction anymore because you don't have any taxes. But they want the deduction. So the housing industry wants the income tax simply because they can have a deduction. And they're always going to support politicians that keep that deduction in place because that's their meal ticket. The last thing they want is no income tax because then there's no special break for them. And of course, the politicians need the income tax because that's the source of all their breaks. See, they pass this horrible tax and then they go to various constituents and say, give me money and help elect me and I'll pass some kind of exemption to get you out of this horrible tax. Right. It's like the mafia. Um, basically going around the country, extorting money for protection, right? Hey, you know, pay me this money and I won't burn down your store, right? That's what they're doing. That's why they want these terrible taxes. That's why I've always said the most important thing we can do is take the power away from government. As long as government has power, they're going to use it. So the only way to turn the situation around is to limit the power of government. But unfortunately, nobody is doing that. Everybody wants government to be more powerful because it's a powerful government that can deliver the goodies and win the votes. And unfortunately, that is the situation that we are in. And, you know, that's why I said earlier, let's at least get the word out there. right? Let people know uh, what I'm saying. Tell them about my YouTube channel. Hey, by the way, I did this uh, interview on Spotlight on Reuters TV. Uh, three-part interview. I'm not sure how many people saw it. It's a pretty good interview. I posted it on my Facebook page. Uh, it's not on YouTube, but you can see there's a link. You go to the first video, and then you know you can see the other three. Or just you know go to Google and, and search Spotlight Peter Ship, and, and the three segments will come up. So you can check that out. Also, you know I was on the Alex Jones show the other day. Haven't done Alex Jones show in a while. Uh, check that one out. I put that up on my YouTube channel. But you know spread these videos. Get people to hear the truth. We have the tool. We have social media. We have the internet. You know, so we can get the message out. But unfortunately, we're not going to outvote anybody. That's just not going to happen. It's just we don't have the numbers, right, to to win this at the ballot box. At least not yet. But the important thing that we can do, and what I'm trying to help everybody do, is at least preserve their wealth. That's going to be key. At least getting money out of harm's way, recognizing that this is going to end in a currency crisis. Right. This is what's going to bring this party to an end. It is coming. Right. The dollar is going to fall. We're, you know, the chickens are going to come home to roost. And in the meantime, you got to protect yourself. That's what I'm trying to help people do. And if I'm right. Right. And this happens. And if you follow my advice, not only will your family be protected, not only will you have your preserved your wealth, but you will preserve your position to help the country. Right. I mean, if this country is in a ship that's going to sink, you need to get in a lifeboat. 
right? Because if you want to help other people from drowning, you can't do that if you're in the water drowning yourself. Oh, 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 oh,